Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast. Welcome back. I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. This is episode 306. Today's guest is Joe DeSanto. Joe spent his childhood riding BMX bikes, break dancing, and tagging abandoned buildings, but the carefree days of his youth wouldn't last long. By 13, he was working as a busboy helping his recently divorced mom put food on the table. A valuable lesson was learned by Joe. If you don't deal with your money, your money will deal with you. From that point on, he made it his mission to learn everything he could about making smart money moves. It paid off. By age 30, Joe had wiped out 70000 in student loans, married the love of his life, bought his first house, and started his own post-production company in L.A. with over 30 employees and $5 million in annual revenue. During this time, he and his wife also transacted on over a dozen residential and commercial real estate properties, but nothing had more life-changing impacts than the birth of their son. Having semi-retired at age 43, Joe's efforts are now focused on his educational blog, Play Louder, where he uses fiscal know-how amassed over his lifetime to help individuals and business owners navigate their finances, increase their net worth, and plan for a better future. So I'm excited to bring Joe on the podcast. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right, today I welcome on the show, Joe DeSanto. Joe, hey, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, man, absolutely. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. Joe, before we got started, I was just on your website, playlouder.com, which we'll get into. I don't mean to jump right into it, but you and I were just talking and reminiscing about your experience buying property in Belize. So we'll get into all that. I'm really interested in digging into those details. But before (laughs) we get into all of your real estate endeavors, just Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, your background, what drew you into real estate investing and kind of what you're doing today. Sure. I like to refer to myself as kind of a do-it-yourself entrepreneur, I guess. You know, I've always had a great interest in, you know, finance, personal finance, money, investing type things Mm -hmm. and real estate, of course. But ironically, what I studied in school was art. I didn't particularly study uh, business or finance per se. And I always wanted to have my own business, much like you wrote about on your website, Jacob, your parents were business owners and it sort of influenced you. My father uh, owned a plumbing and heating company. And just, you know, I think that's a really valuable thing. It's just sort of instilled in you that the idea of having a business is very, very attainable and it's sort of a mindset. So I wanted to pursue the art, but have business, you know, own a business. And I kind of figured out a way to combine those things in the businesses that I owned in Los Angeles. But back to the do-it-yourself entrepreneur thing, you know, not particularly studied in finance and owning a business, but I just like to do things. I like to just dive in and kind of learn by doing. Yeah. Uh, it's fun and it's always, you know, intensely educational as opposed to just doing it, you know, school style learning. So that's kind of why I adopted this idea of being a do-it-yourself entrepreneur. I just go out and give it a try and, you know, do my best. And so far, so good. I've been relatively successful in the various things that I've attempted to do, but not always. You know, you're learning as you're going. That's okay. As that do-it-yourself entrepreneur, you have to become comfortable with making mistakes. That's for sure. Oh, yes, absolutely. You have to become comfortable with making mistakes. You have to become comfortable with working a lot of hours. (laughs) And something else you actually have to do that I think about a lot that you don't always expect is you end up having to be comfortable being like a leader with people and managing people and sort of being 
you know, a good referee amongst your staff if you go that route and end up having a staff. So there's a lot of human dynamics involved in being an entrepreneur. And I think that really, you spe- need to spend time kind of studying that, reading books, and learning about ways to do that successfully. And that's something I didn't always think about at first, but it turned out to be a big aspect of, of all of it. Yeah, for sure. Let's get into that in just a second. But I, it reminds me of this quote. I've heard that an entrepreneur is someone who works 80 hours a week, so they don't have to work 40 hours a week. So <laughs> probably pretty accurate. That's about right. Yeah. I don't know if that's a sad statement or not, but it's a true one. That's for sure. But yeah, as they say, if you do what you love, it doesn't feel like work, right? Sure. Well, Joe, so you studied art in school. You really were kind of drawn to being an entrepreneur, building your own businesses. So that didn't actually start in real estate for you. So kind of tell us your journey from the early beginnings to now where you are today. Yeah, for sure. I don't know what exactly it was, but I just always had this interest in real estate, even from when I was in school. Like, it just seemed like a good idea to me. It seemed like a good thing to be doing while I was doing whatever else I was going to be doing in life. And even in like college, I was like renting the place and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how much this house costs. Like college towns are probably a good place to have rental properties potentially. Like, is we, you know, would this be a good thing to do? I'm renting this place. I mean, geez, I wish I just owned it, you know? And yeah. so I even started kind of investigating it then. And at that time, you know, I just didn't have the resources to do it. If I did, I probably would have jumped in on it. But then when I got out of college, I, you know, I was renting and just kind of like, you know, think I kept saying to myself, God, that just seems like a waste of money. I feel like if I'm putting the money towards this thing, I should own this thing, shouldn't I? It just made sense to me. So I kept pursuing it. Like, you know, Right out of college, I wasn't making a lot of money, but I was curious about the real estate thing. I'm like, how can I get into this? And I was learning about, you know, FHA loans and low down payment loans. And, you know, it's kind of sad to say, but I was going out and looking at property and (laughs) just telling the realtors that, you know, I was, you know, getting pre approved or whatever. Right, right. (laughs) Sadly, I was probably wasting their time, but, you know, I just figured I want to get out there and see what this whole searching for real estate thing is about. And, I just kept pursuing it. It was just always on my mind. And I knew obviously having some resources to get in was fundamental. So it it pushed me to save for that. And then eventually I was able to strike with my purchase of my first home when I was 28. But I was in Los Angeles and real estate's expensive in Los Angeles. So that was a tough thing to do at at that age. But it's, it's worked out really well. And that property helped me in so many ways and other aspects of my life. It just proved my thinking was correct. Owning real estate proved to be a valuable thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Joe, that mindset that you mentioned, the mindset of owning a business is very similar to that mindset of kind of getting started investing in real estate. Like you said, like one of the things that was holding you up is just, you know, this overcoming like this idea of I don't have the resources, right? And that could be time, it could be money, but many people have a resource that they don't tap into. That's like their motivation, their thoughts, their kind of mindset, right? Once you start thinking about how to make this thing being real estate investing possible, there's definitely opportunities. So what did that challenge look like for you? And how did you eventually become a property owner? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say in general, as you mentioned, in mindset is key in life and in business and in real estate. And I look at my life as an individual and the real estate and the businesses all as a business, you know, Before I owned a business, I was in the business of me. I think, you know, every piece of property is a self, you know, sustaining little business. You know, there's income, there's expense, you need to find efficiency, you need to put the effort in to make it be a winner. So in business and all those things, you do have to be positive and you have to like, you know, just keep your eye on the prize for the long term. And where you are not able to put the pieces together at one time, you have to say, okay, well, what pieces am I missing here? And how can I achieve those pieces? You know, a lot of times it is money and that's going to come through savings from your job. It's going to come through possibly finding partners to do something with. It's going to come from, you know, potentially kind of making a partner out of the owner of a property and saying, hey, can you do carry some financing? Though I haven't actually successfully accomplished that one, but many people do. So you just have to look at what the hurdles are and just constantly keep, you know, scratching your head of like, how can I solve this? Or how can I get over this hurdle? 
And that's always, you know, in every aspect, I think, of life in, you know, regular business and in the business of real estate. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us, you know, what was your transition into the world of real estate investing and how did you navigate that? Well, because I focused much of my quote unquote business adventures in other areas, real estate for me was, you know, kind of an add on piece. Part of what I do with my side and with my clients and stuff is, you know, I'm trying to help them navigate the big picture of making money, but also then taking that money and having it make more money and, you know, be efficient and, you know, build wealth. And I think for me and for everyone, it is a combination of what I like to say, you have to be financially prudent, business minded and investment focused. And real estate has been the primary like, you know, vehicle of investing for my wife and I. And so, you know, it wasn't like I was making a business out of real estate, like being a realtor or, you know, just focusing on real estate as a business. But I was like, I want to keep adding it on to what I'm doing in life. And the way you do that, and I've done it in multiple ways, is the first step for me was buying a house. Like there's a lot of debate about out there about whether it's better to rent or own. Or, you know, sure. To me, yeah. it's, to me, it's a non-debate. But, you know, people of significance in their own writings and books have said that personal residences are not an asset. I don't really get that. Like, I look at it this way. If I don't own the property, you know, I could consider myself a renter, period, right? But I could just own one of the properties that I'm renting in my life. You know, it's like if rental property is a good enough thing to do without you occupying it, it's certainly a good thing to do with you occupying as well, if that makes sense. So I'm like, I want to get into real estate by owning the property that I reside in, and I'm just going to pay rent to myself. <laughs> you know, yeah, let's let's dive into that. Like, tell us more about your mindset on that, because you're right. There are many people out there who kind of have the opposite view. Namely, you know, let's think of like Robert Kiyosaki when he talks yeah, about, you know, your I didn't want to not... say it, but I think him putting <laughs> we'll that him in, in his book, which I read a long time ago, and by and large, I liked and agree with. I just don't get that statement to this day. Well, by if his definition, it makes not your sense, business right? I'm sorry, by what definition? By Robert Kiyosaki's definition of a liability and an asset, your house is in sense a liability in the fact that it doesn't pay you every month in terms of cash flow, right? And that's, I think, his point, but I'd be interested to know yours and your perspective. Right. Well, like, again, I kind of disagree with that statement. I mean, the way I look at the benefit of potentially renting is just renting a house you don't own versus renting a house you do own is that what is the alternative? Like if you can have housing for free, then yes, it's not going to be a good thing for you. If you can have housing tremendously below market value, like you inherit somebody's house that's been rent controlled for 30 years and it's $200 a month, then yes, you might be able to make a case for it. But most people that rent out properties want to raise the rents and keep them up with fair market value. So by and large, you are going to be paying fair market value for the place you live. And you're probably going to have to keep increasing the rent or your rent is going to continue to be increased by the owner of the property. So if you're putting that money out there, you might as well own the asset. And essentially, the asset is collecting rent that's just coming out of your pocket. So when you look at it that way, the asset just performs like any other rental. It actually has income, it has expense. But the other huge value of it is, is you're the best tenant in the world. You're not going to complain all that much. You're going to take care of the property. You don't require any kind of management whatsoever. Yeah. And then in addition to that, because, you know, it's owner occupied, you get all the tax benefits of an owner occupant, which actually, in my opinion, are much better than the tax benefits you get from being an actual landlord with a tenant that's not you because you get tax benefits you know, with expenses along the way, namely interest and taxes. And if you have a home office, you get additional deductions that way. But when you go and sell the property, you get no tax up to $250,000 individually or $500,000 as a couple at all. So if you're married and you made $500,000 of profit on your residence, you pay no tax on that. That's $125,000, generally speaking, gift from the government that you wouldn't otherwise get on a traditional rental property, right? So I've done the like, you know, the other thing I like to say about myself is I do the math. Like you can love you it. Can talk about <laughs> crap, you know, all you want and have opinion and this, that, and the other. And, you know, what I like to say is good for ratings, this, that, and the other. But most things you can just do the math on. 
And I have done the math on this renting versus owning thing. And by and large, the numbers are just overwhelmingly compelling and beneficial for being the owner of your residence. I mean, the conditions would have to be very unique for you to actually do better as a renter or better not owning a residence. And, you know, I've sliced and diced them anyway. I got a bunch of spreadsheets because I make this point a lot. I really think that people's first step in real estate should just be owning, you know, their residence. Now, if there are some caveats like, I know I'm only going to be living in this particular area for six months or whatever, you know, or I live in a place that's extremely expensive, like, you know, LA or New York or whatever, and yeah, I just can't do it. So, but again, all those things you can do the math on and figure out like, well, how much is too much? Like, what can I get away with? Other people also say that they don't want to be house poor. And I'm like, well, you can't say you don't want to be house poor. And then if you believe that you really should be saving a lot of your money every month, because House poor just means you're pouring more money into the equity of your house, which is essentially a savings account that is then, you know, embedded in an investment that historically does very well. So you're not house poor, you just have a really extreme savings rate for yourself, which is a really good thing to do anyway. So anyway, yeah. if you get me started on this, I'll meander <laughs> forever. No, it's so good. Anyway, I really like you know, I just, again, felt that it was a good thing to do. So I put a lot of my money into getting into my first house in LA, which, you know, at 28, it was $460,000. That's a lot of money. But then I applied this idea to the next level. We had started a business, my partners and I, and it was going well. And we were leasing a space out of the gate. We actually did a sub, took over a sub lease. And then we had about three years and three years in, we were, or two years in, we were growing and we were needing more space. So. It was my, you know, interest and job to kind of go out there and find this. And I'm looking around and at spaces to lease and, you know, commercial real estate in Los Angeles is very expensive. And, you know, I learned quickly that, you know, businesses need to customize their space. And, you know, landlords don't do that. You pay top dollar for the real estate, triple net real estate, and then you have to put a bunch of money into renovating it. So I'm like, wait a second, I'm going to go spend like $25,000 a month to rent this person's place and I'm going to renovate it for them? <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why would I do that? I should buy the place just like my house, you know? So we did that. It was a hard thing to do, actually, because the stakes, you know, continually go up as you grow in life. But, you know, the SBA actually offers a good program for owner occupants of businesses. You can go in 10% down on commercial real estate if you occupy more than 51% of the space. You can essentially office hack the rest if you want to, you know, fill the gap. Yeah, okay. I if like you it. will. Otherwise, if you're not doing an SBA, I mean, you got to be in, at that time, you had to be in at 30 to 40% down. Now it's 50%, you know, post huge recession. So I'm like, wow, I can get in for 10%. Okay. And if you do the math on how much money you're saving every month in amortization versus it all going out to rent and the fact your rent never goes up and your amortization always goes up over the long run, you're like, the math is just undeniable on this. If I can own, I should own it. So we did that. We eventually bought our office. So it's like buying your house. You just We bought our office. And that turned out to be a really good thing to do. You know, we made a lot of money on that. Like we eventually needed to grow and get into a better space. So eight years later, we sold it. We tripled our cash investment. We took half of that money, did another SBA loan, parlayed it into our new bigger office that was even better that had an awesome huge parking lot. And that our company, you know, is still in that office, is in that office. I'm owner of the building with my partners. I'm no longer an owner in the company, you know, that's renting it. But, yeah. you know, the funny thing is when you're a business and you own your residence, quote unquote, it's like, it's always in an LLC and it's a very, you know, strict delineation. Like your business, the occupant is the renter. Yes. It pays the business, you know, the LLC that owns the property as the owner of the property. And it's a very clear thing. And, you know, it, it just relates exactly to when I was saying you own the property you reside in. You're always a renter. You're always putting out money for housing, whether you own the property you're putting it into or not. So you yeah. might as well own the property. You know, and then the other, you know, other people say, well, you know, I don't want to be tied down. I don't know. I might move. I might not live here forever. I'm like, great. Well, you turn it into a rental. You know, there you go. You started your real estate empire with your residence. Now you're going to move, you can go buy another residence, get all the tax benefits of that, and you got a built-in rental, you know, that you're going to press on with. 
Absolutely. I completely agree with the things you're saying, Joe, and I understand them. One thing I like what you're doing is your numbers-driven approach, right? You're calculating the different scenarios, rent versus buy. Do I buy the business building? Do I lease the business building? You know, those kinds of things where some people are like, I don't know if I want to be tied down, a wishy-washy feeling kind of uh, driven motivation, right? So you've got some numbers to back up your decision. And I like that. And uh, obviously, you can get behind it. Now, let's... And I'm happy uh, to share those numbers with anyone who's listening, by the way. Just hit me up. Yeah. Okay. Great. And another thing you brought up is a pretty good point. Great points are there are some benefits to buying your primary residence and living in it and perhaps renting out the other rooms, house hacking it. Maybe you're buying a duplex, triplex, fourplex. One of those huge advantages is the loan you can get on an owner-occupied property, right? You can get a low down payment loan. So you've got a low point of entry. You can subsidize your portion of the mortgage by, you know, renting out bedrooms or other units in your property. Like you said, in your office building, you could rent out the other 49% to other office occupants. What'd you call it? Office hack, if you office will. Office hacking, so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, there's some great advantages for one to get started investing in real estate. We I talk agree. A, we right, talk sorry, about that a lot. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, yeah, no, you're I, good. <laughs> one of the, you know, I've mentored, I guess, I like to say I've mentored a lot of younger people through owning a business and hiring lots of people. And I've had a variety of assistants over the years. And I try to give them advice. Some of them want it, you know, some of them, you know, they don't care, <laughs> but that's fine. In expensive markets like LA, you know, a lot of the question is, how do I do it? And I really think a multifamily property is like the way to go. You can do it with friends if you want to. If someone else is interested in real estate, you can split it up. You each occupy a unit then you have other units to rent or you can just do a duplex. There are ways you can do it. And, I, and when you look at the math, it just very likely will prove to be very worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So Joe, you're obviously a proponent of owning the house you live in, owning the totally. property your business occupies is a better way to say that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a one thing at a time kind of philosophy, right? You can only yes. occupy one property at a time. So at what point did you start growing beyond just yes, owning, <laughs> owning, my, yeah. owning my residences, so to speak? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so after I started the business, so my second property that I bought was a rental. I saw the value, you know, it was proven to me the value of real estate ownership. So I was like, I want to pursue this more. And I think I should be doing it, you know, in parallel to all the other things I'm doing in life. So I started seeking out places to buy rentals. But in California, it's expensive in the numbers there, just as a rental alone, don't always work. I mean, rarely they do. Yeah. And I think I'm a generally conservative person, I guess, when it comes to money. And I was you know, looking up real estate rental laws and I'm like, wow, California, you know, it's very pro-tenant, to be honest, you mm -hmm. know, be very honest. There are issues in regards to rent control. And I had, when I started talking to people about it, I had heard a story of a friend who rented out a place and they got, they essentially got a scammer who squatted in there for six months. I mean, he was a professional, so it wasn't like he was a squatter as in like a homeless person. But what he does, I guess, was, you know, he rents places out and then he just stops paying the rent, you know, as long as he can. And then he leaves, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, wow, well, that doesn't sound good. So I just started looking out of state and, you know, both for the financial aspects of it and for some of the protection aspects of it. And I was reading things and I ended up finding Austin as a potential candidate because obviously you're looking for, you know, places that have growing economies and, you know, reasonable rental tenant laws and correctly priced housing and so on. So I ended up buying a duplex in Austin. You know, my goal, I think, was just like most people's goal. I'm like, hey, so, okay, I'm going to buy this place and it's going to pay for itself. Well, hopefully, generally speaking, for the yeah. most part with the rent. And then eventually it's going to be all paid for. And then most of the rent is now going to go into my pocket. And that's going to be the source of income for retirement. You know, it's pretty simple stuff. So I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. That sounds like that makes sense to me because I'm probably going to not going to want to work forever, even though I feel like I'm probably going to be, at least at the time. So I'm like, I'm just going to do that. I like that. You know, and I like the other option, obviously, is when you're trying to grow your saved funds alongside your work is the public markets, your stock market and, you know, bond markets, commodities, whatever. And I do that, but there's something about it. 
you're just sending your money out into the abyss. It's you don't have to do anything, which is great, except for click a few buttons on your computer. And and that is the truly passive form of investing. But I'm like, I just don't know anything about what's going on with these ventures. You know, I'm just totally I in the dark over here. Like the CEO could, you know, be stealing from the company and like we're gonna get an announcement tomorrow that he's going to jail and the stock price drops. You know, I mean Beyond the fundamentals that you might look at for businesses out there, there's so many other factors like, you know, activity of other people trading the stock, insider information. I mean, there's all these things that are just not related to the business function itself that can Unforeseen change Unforeseen global pandemics, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I was just like, I don't know, real estate is simple, you know, I understand it. I like property, but maybe because my family are in the plumbing business. It's like I know a little bit about how to fix things. And it's not that complicated. You know, it's a simple business that historically has proven to produce good returns for people to get into it and pay attention. So I was like, I think I'm going to put my money more into this real estate game. And so I bought the duplex. And, you know, you don't always get it exactly right out of the gate. Ended up doing great overall. But the cash flow aspect, honestly, cash flow is an interesting topic for me in general. I have some debates about the cash well, let's get into thing. it. But well, okay, so cash flow, you know, it's a little bit of a mystery to me. Like, again, I do the math. And I recently, I essentially do many studies on like, my own stuff. You know, yeah. so I've transacted on total real estate projects about 16 so far. Eight of those were essentially out of state, what you might consider turnkey real estate, or at least, you know, definitely considered managed real estate. And the cash flow on those is it's never been great. It's just never been good. You know, I read a lot about people who are like, I'm getting 300 a door a month. I'm scaling it up like crazy. And I'm happy for those people. Don't get me wrong. And I want to know exactly what they're doing. But I follow the basic rules and tendencies of real estate investing. And I guess, I don't know if I've been unlucky or whatever, but there's just a lot of expenses that have popped up or, or turnover or whatever. All of the real estate ultimately is performed and, you know, but it's like, I look at real estate now more on an IR, I guess you would say, or internal rate of return sure. or cumulative total performance. And, you know, cash flow is sort of a lure and it's like people want to retire early, this, that, and the other, and they want to have a hundred properties and make 300 bucks a month a door or whatever. Yeah. If you can do that, great. But in my experience, I was like breaking even. Some of them were slightly cash flow positive. Some were cash flow negative. And it also depends on how much you put down. So I was like, I want to really do the math on all this and really study it. So I did a little study of all my own properties to try to figure out accurate average percentages over eight properties in three different states. I want to know what the average monthly or annual expense for repairs is, for turnovers is, because anytime you buy a property, you know, the person selling it's like, I'm going to average 5% for expenses and 5% for turnover. That's the standard thing. So total uh -huh. 10%. I'm like, I've never seen that, Matt. I want to know what mine are doing. And I can share this information with you too. And it's just double that, you know? So, and you might get really good cash flow for a while. And then all of a sudden you get a turnover and, you know, you, you got to do a whole bunch of repairs and it just sort of gets unwound. So I don't look at real estate overall, like just on a cash flow basis, because that's just one portion of how you measure the results. The other portions are appreciation amortization, tax benefit, which is a huge driver of real estate returns. And, you know, you have to also factor in there, you might, do I have to do improvements? You know, if I sell this thing and I want to make a profit, and usually, yes, you do. So that's going to be a thing that you got to plan for. And then the other aspect is, is the depreciate in value in lieu of selling it to capture any of my gains via appreciation or amortization. Can I refi money out? And often you refi money out essentially tax-free which is another amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. So I've devised over the years a system of tracking all these things and generating ultimately a compound annual growth rate for the total return that then I can then compare to the S&P or the public markets in general and determine if the money I'm putting to work in rental real estate is actually beating what the all easier alternative is. I mean, because ultimately you buy rental real estate to make money. I mean, I jokingly say, unless you just like to go sit outside of it inside, you know, in your car and look at it all day, you know, if right. that, that's exciting for you, then that's another reason to buy rental real estate. <laughs> but, but 
I don't do that. You know, I, I do it to make money. So I was like, I really want to know how much money am I really making? And you get rid of the noise, get rid of like the sound bites and the cash flow numbers and this, that, and the other. And you can do the math and figure it out. You know, so I spend time. I guess I'm a bit of a sadist or something in that sense. I spend time with spreadsheets, like doing the math on these things. And by and large, my results have been that, yes, even managed real estate, in particularly managed real estate, you know, that's the ones where you have more expenses and more things that you can't control a lot because it's out of state. You can't do stuff yourself. That's the one I was looking at it. Is that better than SP? And I think by and large, it is. Yes. And results of this analysis are always, you know, there's caveats like, what was the time period? You know, I'm happen to be relating a lot of my results to a period of the S&P from 2009 to 2019, where the S&P just Longest you know, complete market, out, you know, out of average character, quadrupled. You know, people talk about us being in a giant bull market for 10 years, but I'm like, yeah, but we lost 60% of the value of the S&P, like the two preceding years. I mean, the odds that we'd be in a bull market for a while are pretty darn good. <laughs> I mean, if we weren't, we'd essentially, the country would be out of business. So when you compare stuff to that level of growth in such a short period of time, you have to factor that in, you know? So I think when factoring that in on the whole, real estate, even managed real estate that incurs a lot more expense than you would like, you know, and hope to get, still outperforms stock market or the public markets. So in your perspective, in your financial analysis, your personal real estate holdings have outperformed the S&P 500, even with some of your inflated expenses higher than you initially expected. Yes. And I'll show you this. I mean, out of the eight properties, the eight managed out-of-state properties studied, four beat the S&P for the same time period. And this was in the last nine years. Four did not. They were close. One was actually pretty bad. But again, you're looking at a time period of the S&P where, you know, quadrupling in that time period is, you know, roughly talking about 13, 15% compound annual growth. That's very unusual. Real estate has also done really well in that time period, but it's more than likely grown by 50 to, I'm going to say 200%, right? So when you factor that in, yes, I think all of them ultimately on average outperformed for sure. Now, if you factor in the properties that residences that I've owned and also business properties that I've owned will, you know, outperform the S&P, no question, because all of those properties have more tax benefit to them. And also, you know, I'm either a resident, so I'm managing them essentially. And so I don't have those costs. And like, I do a lot of stuff myself, you know, to save money on expenses, you know, and just generally speaking, I feel like when tenants have a property manager, my instinct is that they're more likely to complain and like ask for lots of stuff to be done. Whereas if like for the properties I've self-managed, like here in Florida, you have a relationship with the tenants, you know, and I think that if they know you're going to come over, you know, with your toolbox, they might be like, eh, maybe I should just try to pull the hair out of the drain myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. I really want Joe coming over here and like seeing the pet that I have that I'm not supposed to have or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know if that's true. I don't have any statistics on that, but that's my guess. And when I do the math on stuff that I've managed myself, by and large, the percentages for expenses and so on have been less. So it's a thing. So you've done all this financial analysis, this forensic accounting, if you will, to kind of mm -hmm. see how your portfolio is tracking something I think a lot of people could do better at, especially me, because I'm always like forward thinking, like on to the next deal, right? And I'm never yeah. really taking the time to really go back and look and see if my initial projection is, you know, lagging yeah, yeah. or leading that the actual. So that's pretty interesting. But uh, obviously, you're doing doing well with it because you're continuing to invest. So kind of tell us about what you're doing these days. Is it still out of state turnkey rentals? What's that look like for you? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I do want to say, you know, my personality, I jokingly say, is I kind of toe the, the straddle the line of being a realist and a cynic. So I really like to know the facts. Like, I don't always paint this like, you know, super rosy picture and all that. But I think there's a place for that <laughs> you know, in the world right now. Everyone doesn't have to be like, you know, a motivational speaker. I guess the point of that is to say, I think it's worth it. You know, like I'm not in any way trying to be negative. You need to do these things. Real estate is a really, really valuable tool and asset, and people should be in it, in my opinion. But to, to answer your question, 
because I'm now in a market, I live in Florida and I'm in a market where I can buy rental real estate that actually, you know, reasonably fits the bill of a good investment. I want to get my out of state equity here. Okay. Because yeah. it's a hundred percent true that you do better with rental properties if you manage them to yourself. You know, the more work you put into anything, the more you get out and you save money and you know the properties get managed better, they get maintained better. So like if you want to get into real estate where you can, you know, uh, at least, you know, single family rentals or small multifamily, where you can manage yourself, you should be because you're going to make more money. So I want to get the equity down here where I can be the manager of the property. So I'm kind of trying to sell stuff. And it's a good time, well, it was prior to the COVID, to sell. So I've been slowly selling these pieces in other states and trying to get that equity down here. And so now I have two rentals down here uh, purchased in the last year and a half. And as I mentioned, like the amount of activity I feel like on repairs and this, that, and the other is less, you know. But also like depending on what kind of property you buy, you know, for people that are experienced in the real estate stuff or fairly, it's like you probably heard the ratings of neighborhoods, you know. I don't do like cash flow properties, like C class stuff. Like I think because I'm kind of more conservative, I'm more of an A, B guy and now even kind of an A guy. It's you don't get the cash flow, but you get more appreciation, you get you know, better quality tenants, I think you get less headaches. And for stuff that I'm managing myself, like I feel more comfortable with my equity in those places. And so those are the kind of properties that I bought here in Florida, the two that I bought. So they're more expensive. You're not making the one percent rule, but I can test that if you're focused on total growth and like not just cash flow, but total long-term return when you factor in every aspect of the property, I think you're going to do better with those. But you might end up having to put some more cash into it in a given year if you have, you know, a major issue, you know, having full on. I mean, I actually, I was listening to Robert Kawasaki the other day. Did I just say Robert Kawasaki? I think I said, I'm thinking of the Apple guy, but you know, I'm talking about Richard Poor Dead. And he was saying, you know, his main area is he called it next stop the street. He likes real estate, whether, you know, it's single family or apartment or whatever, where the tenant's next option besides living there is living on the street. You know, (laughs) I was like, wow, that's a pretty intense thing to say. But so I'm going to say, you know, C class, maybe even it's section eight or whatever. And I'm just like, oh, man, that just seems like a lot of work. Just seems like a lot. And then I'm like, these properties, it's, I don't know if you could unload them really that fast if you had to in a pinch, you know, like properties that are in better neighborhoods. And so and they sell more quickly and you can sell them retail as opposed to selling to other investors. Yeah, that's a big point. Actually, that's a point I'd like to make. One thing where I've had some success is because I bought some turnkey stuff off turnkey providers and they're selling based on, you know, rent. So if if you can rent for a thousand bucks, you know, they're trying to sell it for a hundred thousand, let's just say on the 1% rule. Well, you can often go take that reasonably well renovated place. Maybe it's in a B neighborhood where the renovations don't have to be pristine. You know, they can be just decent, you know, granite countertops and nothing crazy. And you can go sell it on the retail market for a premium because you're always going to get more money when it's an individual buyer. So where I've had the opportunity, like if a tenant is left or whatever, I spruce up the house and sell it retail. I don't try to sell it to another investor and I make more money on the sale. That unfortunately hasn't been the case in every sale. And I actually talk about this in a couple of my blog posts, but I've done that like three times. And I mean, it's done really amazing, you know, on value improvement. Just because when people are buying a house for themselves, like the motivations, you know, just it's different. And they're not just buying it based on the numbers, you know. So if you put a really nice property together, it looks good. You know, you do all the things to sell it right, you're going to get a premium. So it's kind of a nice little gap. Where it's like the flip to investors, they're doing the renovations and they're, you know, I've even asked some of them, hey, you're doing this work anyway. How about we don't just go get the cheapest tile at the Home Depot and just put it everywhere without trim pieces and stuff like that? How about we just get like the white tile that looks really nice or this tile that's a little more expensive? Do trim pieces around the shower surround like you know, just (laughs) let's spend an extra 5%, you know, and I'll pay the difference. Because if I want to sell this thing in the next three or four years, it's not going to look sloppy. You know what I mean? It's going to look like maybe there was a little bit of thought put into it. Like, let's not paint it like crazy colors or just all beige or whatever. 
And that's proven to be kind of a, a decent strategy. And most of the time, they've been open to that. They've been open. If the place is already renovated and they're working on it, I'll be like, hey, these are some of the materials I like to use. Do you mind swapping these in? Sometimes, you know, the labor is more if the tiles are smaller, but sure. it's usually pretty minimal. So anyway, just a little footnote. Yeah. Well, Joe, a couple points that I'm taking out of your story and to summarize here. You know, you're very numbers driven in your approach to real estate investing. You're really analytical, making decisions based on the numbers, not based on any kind of qualitative features or how you're feeling or what you've heard or what you've been told or even I try. Read. I try. You know, sometimes <laughs> it's, it's, that's hard to get past the noise. I will say that. Sure. And then another thing is, is you know, you took advantage of buying your first house as your primary residence, living in it, you know, building up equity that way. But then when you decided, hey, the numbers aren't making sense where I live, I'm going to invest out of state. You took that action, invested out of state, eventually moved across the country from California to Florida and said, well, hey, I like where I'm living now. I'm going to move my equity back to my now home state where I reside in Florida. So you've been very intentional about where you're investing and and following, once again, those numbers. So I think those are two lessons that the audience members could take out of this conversation. Oh, well, thank you. You were listening. So thanks very much. (laughs) That was a good summary. I meander, so I commend you for making such a concise summary. Oh, that's good. Um, But thank you. Yeah, I really do think it's important to do the math. And, you know, again, I do it and I have spreadsheets and I'm happy to give them to people. And I have some free courses on my site if people want to poke around and get access to some of these tools I've created for myself. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. We'll get into that in just a second. But before we do that, let's wrap up with our lightning round. It's just a series of questions we ask every one of our guests. Are you up for it? Yeah, totally. Let's do it. All right. First question is, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate? And then what did you do to overcome it? Well, it's pretty simple. The biggest hurdle originally was my down payment cash. And uh, what I did to overcome it was work really hard at my job and save money. Yeah. Just as simple as that. Simple as that. <laughs> Joe, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? Yes, I would say willingness to work a lot of hours, for sure. A little bit of my secret sauce, though, I can't really even take credit for. You know, I jokingly say I'm a little OCD. Like, once I get started on something, like, it's hard <laughs> for me to put it down. And while that's not always the greatest trait to have in the world, it is good for business and getting things done. So I've been grateful for that that trait I've been given. Awesome. Well, Joe, do you have an online resource that you find valuable in your day-to-day? You know, I read this question and I thought about it and uh, struggled with it. So I'm just going to go shameless plug. I think playladder.com is a good online resource. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, play louder. We'll link that in the show notes. But I want to. I, wanna... so, I guess the internet, on the whole, is a pretty great online resource. It's a pretty big place. <laughs> yeah. Well, Joe, what book would you recommend to the listeners, and why? There is one book that chock full of extremely valuable information. It's called "The Loopholes of Real Estate." Ah, it yes. was actually part of the Robert Kawasaki Rich Dad like, series. kind of series, mm-hmm. um, and it just the author is a lawyer and. It talks a lot about particularly asset preservation, but there's just a lot of interesting and very valuable bits of knowledge in there. And I I mean, if you haven't read it, like it's just got a lot of good stuff in it. And I would recommend that highly to anyone who's thinking about real estate or currently investing in real estate. A lot of stuff to chew on in that book. Yeah, that's Loopholes of Real Estate. That's in the Rich Dad series. The author is Garrett Sutton, I believe. I might have edited that out. Sounds about right. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Great. We'll link that book in the show notes for audience members to pick up if they haven't yet. Joe, last question in the lightning round. If you were to give advice to your 20-year-old self to go back and get started investing in real estate, what would you tell yourself? Oh, man. I would tell yourself that you need to act like a real estate investor before you have the resources. Don't be shy. Go apply You know, for your loan. Get pre-qualified. Even if you can't get pre-qualified, you'll learn what you need to do to get pre-qualified. Go look at properties. You know, as, as much as I feel a little bad for the realtor that you might be wasting your time, just look at it this way. You're, they're investing time in you. And when you're ready to buy, they'll be the person that you buy with. So it's in their best interest. Get your feet wet. Go look around. Don't be shy. And that will keep you motivated and help you get your eye on the prize. So get out there and uh, start doing the legwork, even if you think you're not ready to buy. Absolutely. I love it. 
Well, Joe, as we're wrapping up here, you actually have an online resource that you've created for all kinds of people out there. So tell us about that. Yes. I alluded to it a couple of times. It's called playlier.com. So it's essentially my website. The way you know, I make a living right now, or you know, fill, I'm not working full-time. I work part-time doing financial and business consulting for small businesses, most in LA, some now in, uh, in Texas and other places. And the website is meant to take all that kind of knowledge that businesses more are likely to pay me for and kind of make it available to individuals. So it's really all about you know, small business endeavor stuff real estate investing, general stock market investing, and personal finance, you know, being personally financially prudent. So I'm putting as much of the information that I have as I can out there. There's still a long way to go, but there's a lot there. I have some free courses and I think some pretty thorough educational posts. So yeah, so let's check it out. Playlouder.com. We'll absolutely link that in our show notes if our audience members want to go check that out. Joe, as we're wrapping up here, any parting piece of advice or last words you'd like to leave with our audience members? I would say I'm going to go back to my new recent kind of slogan. It's like, you really need to be financially prudent, business minded and investment focused to get to the promised land in life. That's what I believe. I love it. Well, Joe, hey, thanks so much. If audience members want to check out more about what you're doing, connect with you, is Play Louder the best place for them to do that? It sure is. Yeah, they can just hit the email me button and it'll send an email right to me. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, Joe, hey, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a lot of fun having you on. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. I really appreciate you having me. Take care. All right, brother. See you. All right, that wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Joe DeSanto. Hey, I hope you got so much value from that conversation. As you can tell, Joe comes at things from a different angle than a lot of people, backed by data and kind of a forensic accounting perspective, if you will. So if you want to learn more about anything we mentioned in the show notes, you can find all of those links to those resources, along with Joe's blog at playlouder.com. Hey, as always, for more information, resources, and to connect with me, you can do so at www.jacobairs.com. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.